Dr. Cameron, um, as I say, thanks a lot for making the trek across town. Um, where were you born and raised? I was born and um, raised for the first 10 years of my life in a small city of 2,000 people in Michigan, Brighton, Michigan. My dad was the general practitioner there, and um, it was an idyllic place to spend the first 10 years of your life. It was a very small community. Uh, everybody knew everyone. It was a very, very pleasant uh, place to uh, be raised. We had a home with a big barn with animals. We had two mules that, with a cart that we would be driven around in. It was just a terrific place for a young individual to be raised. Yeah. Sounds like it. Sounds yeah, idyllic. It was terrific. And then you moved? Uh, to well, my where? dad had gone to medical school at Wayne State University in Detroit, and he'd started out in a surgical training program. But after two years, there was difficulty with the program. He wasn't happy with it, so he decided to go out into general practice. So he moved to Brighton, small community. Then World War two came along and even though he didn't have to go because he was the general practitioner for the Brighton community and surrounding areas, he enlisted and went into World War II and because he'd had two years of surgical training he went in as what's called a 3150. He went in as a surgeon and did surgery uh, for five years in World War II. And then when he returned in 1946, I would have been 10 years old at that time, we moved to Detroit and he went back to receiving hospital and completed his surgical training and then uh, was at Wayne State University and in practice uh, in Detroit there oh, on. <clears throat> I think I know the answer to this next question, but I see you did a, I, from your resume, you did a straight surgical internship yeah. at a time when a lot of people were still doing rotating internships. Well, mo most, no, most institutions at that time had straight internships. The University of Pennsylvania and several other institutions still had rotating. But by the time I graduated from medical school in 1962, most people who were going into surgery applied to surgical programs that had a straight surgical internship. So I took a straight surgical internship. Okay. Well, I had fun reading your presidential address about uh, John Miller Turpin Finney. Yeah, J.M.T. Finney. Right. Because his resume and your resume are almost identical. Well, that's one of the nicest things anybody has ever said about me, to compare <laughs> me to J.M.T. Finney, because he was an absolutely wonderful individual, and he, of course, was the first president of the American College of Surgeons. He was in Baltimore at Hopkins, and he was an absolutely wonderful individual, and his genes have persisted. The Finney family is a marvelous family that still has a major presence in Baltimore, and in fact, he has a great-grandchild who went to Hopkins Medical School, uh, trained in cardiac surgery, and is a cardiac surgeon in Baltimore. But there, there are many Finneys still in and around. But he was an incredible individual, and the fact that he was the first president of the American College of Surgeons is really remarkable because there were many, many choices. The college, of course, was founded in 1913 and they were looking for the first president. There were William Stewart Halstead, perhaps the most innovative, important surgeon, influential surgeon that this country has ever produced, was still active at that time. They could have asked him, the Mayo brothers, Harvey, Kreil. There were many, many, many prominent names most of whom were associated with academic institutions. Keen, W. W. Keene in Philadelphia was another one. But what they wanted was a role model. The college was obviously established to elevate the standard of care of surgery in the United States. So what they wanted was the perfect role model 
for other surgeons in the country and for younger surgeons to emulate. And so they picked this man who was, actually was in pure private practice at Hopkins and at other hospitals in Baltimore because he was this absolutely wonderful human being. Everybody loved him. He had great leadership ability. He led the Red Cross in Maryland. He was trustees on the private boys' schools. and uh, he, he was everything to everybody. He was just a wonderful person. He wrote an autobiography, which I've read on several occasions, and so I feel as if I know J. M. T. Finney, and he was absolutely one of the most uh, marvelous individuals that's ever been in surgery. And so they were right in picking him instead of these other prominent surgeons who had made many, many more contributions to the practice of surgery. But Finney was the ideal role model to put forth as this is what we want to promulgate in the United States. What, what qualities did you admire most about him? Well, he was just a, you know, it's, it's hard to um, picture somebody reading about him. But as I read about him, and particularly his autobiography, he was just this wonderful individual, was kind, considerate, but a terrific, decisive surgeon who people flocked to. He loved children. He loved everybody. Everybody liked him. He had leadership ability. Leadership is something that's very, very difficult to define. When I was chair at Hopkins for 19 years, when I was trying to recruit interns, I was recruiting for leadership ability. We wanted to train people who would go out and seek leadership positions at other institutions. And leadership is, again, something like pornography. It's difficult to define, but when you see it, you know it. He had leadership ability. He just had all the components that people admired and were willing to follow. He was just an amazing individual. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. Um, how did you become interested in the elementary tract as your subspecialty? Yeah, my dad uh, ended up, as I mentioned earlier, as a surgeon, as a general surgeon. And general surgery initially was GI surgery, it was alimentary tract surgery, peptic ulcer disease, colon cancer, intestinal obstruction, incarcerated inguinal hernias. And so um, I became interested in medicine and in surgery because of my father. And as a high school student, a college student, I occasionally would be taken by him into the operating room to watch him operate. And it was generally alimentary tract surgery. And so even though at Hopkins, when I was a medical student, and when I started my residency training there, cardiac surgery was the emphasis because Dr. Alfred Blaylock was the chairman of the Department of Surgery while I was a medical student and an intern, and he was one of the pioneers of cardiac surgery, and he had trained many of the heart surgeons that were in leadership positions around the country, Denton Cooley, Sabiston, Bonson, Muller, there's a long list, uh, Jude, a long list of people, Paul Ebert, they'd all trained in cardiac surgery. But for some reason, I had an interest in elementary tract surgery, and I remember as a intern being called into Dr. Blaylock's office near the end of the year so that he could find out what I was interested in. And I said I was interested in elementary tract surgery. And he sort of lowered his head a little bit, and you know, it seemed to me he was disappointed with that answer. And there was silence for about 15 seconds. But then he said, well, I suppose there are more people with duodenal ulcers than there are with heart disease. So I guess that's OK. So I sort of reluctantly had his approval. And I needed it because he was about to retire. And I wanted to go into the laboratory 
for two years to get two years of research. And by the time I would have come back, he would, was retired. But I needed him to get me an important, productive job. So that's why I was in as an intern instead of after two years where young trainees used to go in to talk to him. And so he got me a job at the Walter Reed Army Institute of Research where I could pursue sort of elementary track projects. And uh, so, and that's where really I got the beginning in my clinical and laboratory interests in pathophysiology of the alimentary tract. And so I owe that opportunity to work in the lab for those two years to Dr. Blaylock. And is, is that where you first um, worked on pancreatic cancer? It was actually, I worked mostly on bilirubin metabolism. There, uh, we had access to all animals, it almost seems, um, that we shouldn't have now in retrospect, but I we had access to monkeys. We could ask for monkeys and we got monkeys to do experiments on. And I became interested in bilirubin metabolism. Bilirubin is what causes yellow jaundice. When somebody has a bile duct stone or pancreatic cancer, they develop jaundice. Mm -hmm. And about the same time, radioactive bilirubin became available. So I took a series of monkeys and ligated their bile ducts so they became jaundiced and then gave them radioactive bilirubin to see how it was metabolized in a patient because the bilirubin will go up when the bile duct is blocked, but it'll go up to 15 or 20 and then stop and it won't go up any higher. And it was always a puzzle, what happened to the bilirubin? So, um, we did a lot of work not only in monkeys with their bile duct ligated, but also we went to uh, Washington Children's Hospital and had access to children with biliary atresia who also have a blocked bile duct. And we gave both the monkeys and the children, the infants, young children, this radioactive building room to see how it was metabolized. And it's an interesting story of how persistence and publication. Um, I sent the article, the most important article on this bilirubin metabolism to SGNO, and it was accepted. Loyal Davis used to read all the manuscripts himself. He accepted it, and three days later by return mail, I got this acceptance. I was so delighted. But he said all the tables and charts had to be eliminated. So I wrote a very, I think, respectful letter back to Dr. Davis saying it would ruin the paper if I did that. So he sent me the manuscript back and said, then you're not being published in SGNO. So I didn't know what to do, but I decided to send it to the New England Journal of Medicine. There was a colleague that said, well, send it to the New England Journal of Medicine. They published it. It was the lead article in the New England Journal of Medicine, and there was... <laughs> an editorial written about it. So the best thing that could have happened was to have it rejected at SGNO, which at the time was the best surgical journal in my mind, but it was even better, obviously, to have it in the New England Journal of oh, Medicine. That's really funny. Um, many people, or most people, hear um, pancreatic cancer diagnosis and figure it's hopeless. Yeah. regardless of surgery or any other treatment. Um, how has the surgical treatment changed over the years since you were a resident? Yeah. Has it become any more effective? That's a or? good, very good question. First of all, to if you have pancreatic cancer or if you're a physician taking care of a patient with pancreatic cancer and the family, you have to be absolutely optimistic because it's a terrible disease and unless, and unless you're very positive and optimistic about it, you're depressed all the time. And I'm an absolute optimist about the management of patients with pancreatic cancer. Now, when I was on the house staff, there would maybe be one or two or three Whipples a year done at Hopkins. 
and Hopkins was no different from any other institution around the world. One out of every four died before, without leaving the hospital. The mortality for doing a Whipple operation, which is the operation for pancreatic cancer, was 25%. And it was 25%. There was a paper written in the Annals of Surgery from Mass General, the Leahy Clinic, the Mayo Clinic, and maybe UCLA. It was a combined series. And in that combined series, from those institutions, which were the top institutions in the country or the world, doing Whipples, the mortality was between 20 and 25 percent. So you know at other institutions that weren't as experienced, uh, weren't tertiary care units, it was much, much higher. So that when I finished my training, I decided to become interested in pancreatic diseases. When I became uh, chief of surgery at the hospital, Johns Hopkins Hospital, and chairman of the Department of Surgery at the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine, I wanted to pick for our department an operative procedure and or a disease in which there was a great deal of room for improvement so that we could make a difference. The mortality for the Whipple operation for pancreatic cancer was 25% at that time. And there were only two or three done a year at Hopkins and most other tertiary care university hospitals. So gradually, we built up the volume. We now do somewhere between 250 and 300 Whipples a year. I myself have done over 2,000 Whipples. And for the first 1,000 Whipples I did, the mortality was 1%. So it dropped from at Hopkins and throughout the world from 25% to 1% over a relatively short period of time. So the, the operation now can be performed safely. Now, is it effective? Well, there used to be, when we, again, when I became interested in this disease in the early 1980s, most series of Whipples for pancreatic cancer, there were no five-year survivors. And the best series, it was about 5%. So now it's up with my personal series of 2,000 Whipples. The first 1,000, the five-year survivor was 19%, and for the second 1,000, for the second 1,000, it was 24%, and it's gradually increasing. Some of that is because of the surgery, but a lot of it is because of, of neoadjuvant therapy chemotherapy or radiotherapy given before you do the operation, or chemotherapy or radiotherapy, adjuvant therapy uh, done after the operation. So the disease definitely, and when in my series, if the Whipple was done and there are no positive lymph nodes, in other words, the cancer hasn't spread to lymph nodes, and the margins are negative, in other words, you took out all the tumor, the five-year survival is about 40%. So it's definitely improving. Now what we need are two things. We need a tumor marker like PSA. Everybody knows about prostatic-specific antigen. It's used to try and detect prostatic cancer in males. And that tumor marker for that disease may be even too sensitive, but what we need is a tumor marker so that when anybody 40 years of age or over goes to see a doctor, amongst other blood tests, a blood test is sent off for a tumor marker for pancreatic cancer. And if it comes back positive, that individual has to be screened so that we pick the disease up earlier. That's number one. And number two, uh, we need better adjuvant, neoadjuvant therapy, immunotherapy, vaccines, chemotherapy, et cetera. But it's on the way. It is on the way. Um, there was no money spent for research in pancreatic cancer 20 years ago. Really? Maybe 30 years ago, money was given to an individual down in New Orleans at um, LSU to distribute to the surgical community 
for research on pancreatic cancer, at the end of five years, he had to give some of the money back. Nobody was doing any research, and therefore, nothing was happening. Today, finally, there are people all over the world. And I like to see, a lot, think, a lot of the research started at the Johns Hopkins Institution. Ralph Ruban, Bert Vogelstein, Scott Kern. Because we started attracting patients with pancreatic cancer, there was material. If you have clinical material, basic scientists, clinical scientists will come and start doing research on it. And there's more money spent on research for pancreatic cancer. There are more basic scientists, there are more clinician, clinical scientists at Hopkins doing research on pancreatic cancer than any institution in the world. And it's because clinical material was attracted there, and, and now that's happened a lot of other places. Massachusetts General Hospital with Andrew Warshaw, who will be the next president of the college. He did the same thing at Mass General. Murray Brennan did the same thing at Memorial. It's happened at institutions. Marcus Buechler, one of our new honorees uh, at the college this year, has done it in Heidelberg. So it's happened all over the world. I like to think it was initially at yeah. Hopkins, but it's happened all over the world. So I'm optimistic. I think tomorrow something great is going to happen. It's already improved, and it's going to improve even more rapidly and more quickly oh, that's in the decade to come. Really interesting, because, I mean, from a layman's perspective, you hear that, and it's... Well, uh, I think even a lot of physicians still consider that. And when they get a patient with pancreatic cancer, often, and studies have shown this in the last several years, they don't refer them to a surgeon or to a tertiary care center really? because they're so pessimistic. You became a fellow in 1975. Yeah. Um, why did you pursue fellowship? You know, when I finished my training, I finished my training in 1970. It was routine in at Hopkins and I think at most university uh, training centers, and I think a lot of the community training centers, you joined the college. It wasn't anything you even thought about. Yeah. You're, you wanted to get into the college. You had to be out two or three years and then you could apply, but it was just routine. Everybody wanted to join the college. Now, unfortunately, that subsequently changed somewhat. But we're trying to rejuvenate that idea that every surgeon should belong to the American College of Surgeons. It's, of course, the largest group of surgeons in the world, the largest society, association, whatever, in the world of surgeons, and it's very important and every surgeon needs to be in it. Now, we believed that back in the 70s, and we've got to get everybody believing that again now. Apparently, um, membership, it didn't fall, but there were fewer people interested in joining. I think so. But, really? you know, this at the convocation, which is uh, takes place at the beginning of the college, mm -hmm. we had 1,600 inductees this year, which is a huge class. I think generally, I don't know these figures exactly, but I think generally we're closer to 1,000. So I, I took that as a very good sign of 1,600 inductees. And there are a lot of people who only join the subspecialty that's um, true. societies? Or? That's true. That's one of the problems. The urologists, the orthopedics, the ophthalmologists, the otolaryngologists, the neurosurgeons, there's so many specialty societies now that they understandably are more interested in their specialty societies because if they come to the American College of Surgeons for this week, there will be some panels, some programs on neurosurgery, orthopedic, etc., but not most of them. Most of the programs will be in another specialty than theirs. If they go to their own associations, their own societies, it's nothing but neurosurgery, otolaryngology, whatever. So it's understandable, but I still think there has to be an overriding group, and that's the American College of Surgeons that looks after all of surgery, including the various specialties. How, 
how do you think the um, the college can be more effective than say the subspecialty? Well, society? because um, I think we're more apt to be with uh, seventy thousand membership. We're more apt to be able to influence Congress. We're more apt to be, apt to be influence uh, uh, legislation. I think with a group that large ethical standards, moral standards, practice guidelines, I think are apt to be more realistic, more forthcoming. Mm -hmm. I think the college has a lot to offer. And I think there was an era where even general surgeons didn't think the college had much to offer them. But Tom Russell, when he was the executive director for a decade, really changed the college and made it more pertinent and more um, focused towards physicians and what they, surgeons, what they needed, what they wanted. And so the college is a new college now and we've got to get everybody aware of that so that we get everybody in it. So for instance, what changes came about? Well, the college used to be for continuing medical education. We would come in the 70s and the 80s and the 90s to take postgraduate courses or to participate, lecture in postgraduate courses, panels, etc. Now the college is interested in every aspect of surgical practice. They have sessions on how to teach new young surgeons just finishing their training, how to set up a practice, how to manage their practice. There are sessions on ethics, on morals, on how to invest money, uh, on all aspects of the surgeon's life today. And that didn't used to be the case. And that was because of Tom Russell's 10 years as executive director. Yeah. Something else I was, I can't think of it. Um, I noticed that you've been you were you've been president of something like eight surgical societies, yeah, yeah. Um, including ACS. Um, why are these other professional associations important to you? Well, first of all, if you're chief of surgery at Hopkins, a lot of things just come. You might not even deserve. They just become because you're the leader at Hopkins. Those other surgical associations are, are important surgical associations. The American Surgical Association, the American College is the largest surgical association. The American Surgical Association is the most prominent surgical association in the world. It's the hardest to get a paper on the program. The program is always outstanding. So it's, it's a very influential, important uh, organization. Now, if you're and people want to be present. They want to have input. They want to add leadership to it. And um, the Southern Surgical Association is a regional association similar to the American, but just for Southern surgeons. The Society for Surgery in the Alimentary Tract. That, that's my specialty. That's alimentary tract specialty. So all of these, the, all of these organizations, there's a reason that if you are interested in leadership, you would want to be uh, able to have a leadership position to influence the direction of it. And I must say, uh, being a chief of surgery at Hopkins is a huge advantage, and a lot of things come to you that you may not even deserve, but you have the opportunity to do it. Right, yeah, I, well. Um. What were you? What were the highlights of your activity in the college prior to your presidency? Well, that's that's an interesting question. I think the one of the best things I've ever done or, or ever been part of. I became treasurer of the college um, maybe eight or nine years before I became president, mm -hmm. and it was at a time when there weren't. The college has a sig substantial endowment, tens of millions of dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars. And it wasn't being managed 
in a systematic, uh, uh, intelligent, learned fashion. So I became the treasurer at the time that the treasurer and the whole college leadership decided we needed professional help in managing this huge endowment. So we hired Cambridge Associates. We all ask around, you know, I ask my university trustees, who, who should we get to help us? And the answer invariably, whoever I asked was, if you have over a hundred million dollars in an endowment and you don't have Cambridge Associates advising you, you need to answer why. So Cambridge Associates was obviously the group to get. We got them and our endowment doubled and tripled during the time I was treasurer. Now, that of course was because that 10 years was a great time. The market was going up, everybody was making money. And so the, the, the treasurer, the finance committee, the subcommittee, we got a lot of credit for increasing the endowment and the funds available to the college, whether we deserved it or not. But it was so much fun working with Cambridge Associates, learning about finance, learning about how to invest, learn how to diversify, learn how to allocate funds, learn how to rebalance them. That it was one of the most enjoyable activities I've been involved with in any organization and it happened to be with the college. So that was the most enjoyable uh, and, and the greatest learning experience for me with the college. Interesting. What did you want to accomplish? I'm also a Scotsman. So, <laughs> so that works. Scotsmen are good with money. <laughs> <laughs> what did you want to accomplish as president of the college? You know, that's a good question. And it, it gives me the opportunity to uh, not every president will, I'm sure, agree with this. The president is not the person who runs the college. The president represents the college. We travel throughout the country to chapters and we travel throughout the world to other colleges representing the college. We don't really run it. It's run by two individuals the chair of the Board of Regents, but even more so by the executive director. David Hoyt now is the man. He really runs the college. Tom Russell, during my tenure, he ran the college. Now, the uh, chair of the Board of Regents had a major input in policy and direction, et cetera. So those two figures, run the college and what's accomplished really are to the credit of the Board of Regents and their chair and the executive director. And by and large, there may be some major exceptions, by and large, not the president. So being the president is a great honor and you represent the college and it's one of the things I'm most proud of. But I didn't really run the college. Well, if Okay, so you weren't running it, and I understand that. I, I totally agree that that the executive director is probably going to be the person with the most. And influence. the board, of, chair and of the board the of regents. Yeah. Board of regents. But um, so, what were the highlights of your presidency? Well, then? I what I wanted to do was promulgate the role of the surgeon as a role model, and that's why my presidential address was on JMT Finney who had been picked for that position because he was a role model. Now, several years before I became president of the college, an unusual thing happened. And the number of medical students applying for surgical training dropped. And some programs, some major university programs, went unfilled. In other words, we have 14 intern slots for surgery at Hopkins. I mean, we f fill them every year. And I think every university program is the same. But the number of applicants decreased, and some of these prominent university programs did not fill. Really? Now, what was going on? 
Well, it was an era in which I think surgeons, us, I hope not me, but maybe even me, were complaining about paperwork. We're complaining about not getting as much reimbursement as we thought we deserved. And I think we were turning medical students off. And I think that's, without any direct proof, I think that's why the applicants decreased and that's why some programs went unfilled. So I wanted to turn it around. I think it already had turned around, but I wanted to emphasize we have to be positive about our profession. You know, there's a statement that I'm very fond of that I probably use once every other day. And I always use it when I'm talking to medical students or young surgical house officers anticipating a career in surgery. And that is, if you pick a profession you love, you never have to work the rest of your life. And I say, that's surgery. And I often say this to medical students when I'm scrubbing it during an operation. And I say, do you think that our chief of medicine right now is doing a history and physical on a sick patient, maybe a patient with a stroke, saying, this is terrific, I love this. No, they're not doing that. They're chief of medicine because they they're wanted to get into an administrative job. They're, they're no longer excited about internal medicine. And pediatrics the same. Do you think our chief of pediatrics is doing a physical on a screaming baby saying this is, but here I am, I'm 77 years old, we're operating, we're loving what we're doing, this is exciting, this is terrific. What do you want to do? Do you want to go into medicine? Do you want to go into pediatrics? Do you want to go into surgery? If you go into surgery, you're never going to have to work the rest of your life. So I'm enthusiastic about surgery as a profession. No other profession I know. My banking friends, my friends in business, lawyers, they have been going through their career looking for the time they can retire. Again, I'm 77. I work seven days a week. I, you know, people say, when are you going to retire? And my answer is, when you're retired, you're supposed to be doing exactly what you want to do. So I'm retired. Interesting. Yeah. So I, that I be, promulgating role modeling was what I tried to do during my presidency. Um, what do you think Obamacare will mean for the practice of surgery? Um, and do you foresee any problems either for the patient or for the yeah. physician? Yeah, you know, I don't care what the system you're in or what the mechanism of payment is or what sort of insurance there is. You're a surgeon, there's going to be a sick patient, you're going to operate on them, they're going to get better the family's going to be grateful. That's your payment. And they could cut my salary in half or down to a quarter today. I'd still be overpaid. Surgeons get paid by the gratification they get. And that's not going to change no matter what the system is. We're still going to be surgeons and there's still going to be patients that need to be operated on. Nobody knows what Obamacare is. That's a stack of papers 2,000 pages long. I don't think there are probably a half a dozen people in the country who have read all 2,000. I don't know exactly all the ramifications of Obamacare, but I do know it was passed by the House, it was passed by the Senate, it was signed by the President, the Supreme Court said it was okay, move on. You know, that's our system for the next decade, move on. and. Uh, it's going to be fine. Okay, thank you. Um, and finally, the future of the of the college. Um, how can it contribute to better health care within the current and future government yeah. regulated? You systems? know, we used to have in our department. I think when I was a junior faculty member. The department and the whole medical school used to have retreats and to plan for the next 15 years, the next 10 years, the next five years, whatever. But they were long-range planning. Today, I don't think there are very many five, 
10-year planning retreats. You, you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. You have to be resourceful. You have to be adaptive. You have to be ready to change. You know, in 1989, we were all doing cholecystectomies through right subcostal incisions. We came to the college and saw these videos on laparoscopic cholecystectomy. That overnight changed the way the gallbladder was taken out. And if you were a general surgeon and part of your practice was cholecystectomy, if you didn't learn how to do laparoscopic cholecystectomies, you weren't doing cholecystectomies in a year. So I think it's very difficult to know how to plan. I think the college has to be adaptive. It has to be forward-looking as much as possible. It has to be responsive. But I don't know what the college is going to look like in five years. But in five years, I hope it's looking forward, being responsive, and trying their best to set the ethical standards uh, and the, the standards of practice for surgery for the country and really for the world. Okay, and I, thank you. And I do have one more question. Okay. Um, you, you attended the history group this yeah. morning. Um, why are you interested? Well, in here's in the that? thing. When I was president of the Southern Surgical Association, my presidential address was on William Stewart Halston. I've given that talk a hundred times since. To surgeons, to internists, to ladies groups, to men's groups, to non-medical groups. I, I love to give that talk. And I, I get emotional every time I, I give it. It was sort of like David McCullough. Did you hear his talk? You didn't hear his talk. But David McCullough gave a talk. And when he, um, he talked about a mastectomy, his voice quivered. It was from his book, John Adams, who won the Pulitzer Prize. Mm -hmm. And I mean, he's probably given this talk a hundred times, mm -hmm. but he got emotional when he was talking about it. I'm that way about history. When I was president of the college, I gave my talk on J.M.T. Finney. Uh, when I was president of the American Surgical, I gave it on uh, John Shaw Billings, who was a great innovator. And so I, I, all my, Harvey Cushing, I have a talk on Harvey Cushing. I love to talk about history. You know, I read now, for about the last 10 years, I've read almost exclusively biographies, mostly not medical, but some medical. Mm -hmm. Because, and I wish I'd started that 40 years ago, because reading about a great person's life, you learn two things. You learn about that era and what life was like in that era. You also learn what Ben Franklin did to become a great man. And I think I would have been a better person had I started reading biographies 40 years ago instead of 10 years ago. And surgical history is essentially reading biographies. Mm -hmm. All of history is a biography about individual and individual or individuals. Yeah. Well, thank you.